Whether you're an old school, die hard Amiga fan, or a newbie looking to see what all the excitement is about, this video is for you. We are going to cover it all, an introductory dive into the Amiga and its emulation particulars, then move to setting it up on your deck, and finally, we'll cover advanced configuration and play. You will be a bona fide Amiga emulation expert when this video is done, so stick around. We are going to discuss the Amiga from an emulation standpoint in the first part of this video. And even if you're familiar with Amiga and its emulation, there are going to be some useful tips in here for you, so I really recommend not skipping ahead. If you're here, you at least know something about the Amiga computer. This 16-bit home PC was so far ahead of its time, it dwarfed almost everything else around it. It featured powerful coprocessors, a true multitasking operating system, and had extremely advanced graphics and sound, making it an arcade-style powerhouse. All of this power, though, comes with a price. It complicates the heck out of emulation, making it far more challenging than simple game consoles or handhelds. The complications are multifaceted, from the core files needed to use it, known as kickstarts or BIOS files, to the non-standard way floppy drives, mice, and controllers were utilized. As a bonus, there's two major models of Amiga using different chipsets, along with two major television standards, PAL and NTSC. All of these put together make for an emulator not super friendly for beginners. Let's start off with the most fundamental piece of the emulation equation. Many platforms we emulate today require a BIOS file, a dump of machine level power on and boot instructions required before a game will even start. On the Amiga, this is called a kickstart. This originally came as a boot disk on early Amigas, but was moved to an upgradable chip later on. Kickstarts are still copyright and they are still sold by licensees of this product, essentially making it piracy to download these image files. The company that owns the rights, Cloanto, has offered up fairly inexpensive packages to get you started. We will not be discussing the acquisition of Kickstarts here. We will assume you have obtained the Kickstarts in a legal way already. Since the Amiga is a proper computer, you have to deal with peripherals like floppy drives, mice, multiple controllers. Games don't tend to adhere to standards, meaning some games may require a mouse and keyboard, some require a joystick in port 1 or port 2, some may require disk swapping as you play through a game. There are tons of situations that will pop up as you journey through Amiga emulation. Amiga computers came in two base configurations. The more powerful was the AGA, Advanced Graphic Architecture Chipset Based Machines, like the Amiga 1200, 4000, and CD32 games machine. The most common Amiga platforms, like the Amiga 500 and 2000, use chips known as ECS, or the Enhanced Chipset, or even OCS, the Original Chipset. Amigas were sold worldwide, as were their games. As such, USA and Japan got NTSC TV formatted editions that ran at 60Hz, while Europe and others got PAL or 50Hz versions. Running a game made for one location in another location could cause the game to run slow, fast, or sometimes even not at all. I realize this sounds frightening, and you may be asking yourself, is the juice worth the squeeze? First, it isn't quite as bad as it seems since emulation on the Amiga is pretty mature at this point. And second, the juice is definitely worth the squeeze. Unlike basic game consoles or arcade games, playing games on an emulated Amiga means you need to be familiar with the formats of images or ROMs you are going to find. You may call these ROMs like with other emulators, but to be fair, they really aren't the same thing. We're going to refer to them as game images. You need to understand the difference so you know how to handle them when you find them in the wild for download and play. ADF. The most basic form of Amiga game image is literally a single file that holds the image of an Amiga floppy disk. These are 880 kilobyte images that represent a single disk of Amiga content. Many games are single disk based and the ADF file works just like a ROM image would for a game console. There is still virtual disk access, which can be slow, and you may be forced to change disks during play as you progress further into the game. 
HDF. If ADFs represent a one-to-one -one copy of a floppy disk, HDF represents a one-to-one -one copy of a hard drive from the Amiga. Usually these will contain full-blown Amiga operating systems, complete with workbench, launchable games, utilities, etc. Most games are not going to be distributed on this format, though. Finally, LHA WHD Load. The most popular and easiest to use format to obtain Amiga games in is what's known as WHD Load Format, which is stored inside of an archive with a .LHA extension. LHA is just a compression format like ZIP or RAR, but WHD load games require certain things stored inside these archives in order to work. Not every Amiga LHA file is a WHD load enabled game image. Most Amiga games could not be installed to hard drives. WHD load did that very thing, sucking in all the disks for a game, packaging them up in a nice folder you could run from an Amiga hard drive. Thanks to all this work for real Amiga owners, emulation folks like us can use these WHD load images almost like cartridges within emulators. A simple one file solution that just works most of the time. It's time to get things set up. Let's start with EmuDeck. For the purposes of this video, we'll assume you have EmuDeck installed and running on your deck. We won't assume you have anything Amiga set up yet. We'll take care of that next. I'll put a link to a couple of good EmuDeck setups in the description below. If you do not have EmuDeck set up, please pause this video and come back once you're set up. Also, we'll be using SSH to connect our PC to deck for the purposes of copying files. You're free to use whatever method you wish, but if you're not set up with SSH, this would probably be a good time to do so. I'll provide a quick three minute video to help you set that up in the description below. Go ahead and get that set up, pause this video, and then come back when you're ready. At this point in the tutorial, you're gonna need those kickstart images. We will assume you own the Amiga Forever Plus Edition that has all the kickstart images included for both ECS and AGA chipset Amigas. If you have your own kickstarts, we'll help you get them renamed correctly and put in the right place. We will assume that you installed EmuDeck on the micro SD card, which means your BIOS and ROM folders will appear within another folder called emulation on the root of that card. Let's get your kickstart files from your PC to the deck. On your PC, navigate to C colon backslash users backslash public backslash documents backslash Amiga files backslash shared backslash dir backslash system backslash devs backslash kickstart. Have to have a whole video just to name where these files are. Of course, we'll provide a link. Within that folder, select all the files without the .rtb extension and copy those files to your microSD card's emulation slash BIOS folder. You put those files right in the root, they will not go into any subfolders. If you're bringing your own kickstarts, you will need to follow the naming conventions you see here, and I'll include MD5 hash checks to verify what you have is indeed the right kickstart image named the same. Okay, that's really the hard part. <laughs> now that you have all your Kickstarter files on the deck, we're ready to actually put some games on. You may already have some Amiga game images, either ADFs or LHA, WHD load files. We're going to assume you don't for this tutorial, and we're gonna do all of our work with the same known good files that we'll provide in a link in the description below. We're gonna use two games that I know are fully legal. I wrote one, and the other one exists in the public domain, and it's a damn good game. Psycho Squares is an ECS ADF, or floppy drive image, while the other is Zombie Apocalypse 2 AGA. And this is a proper LHA WHD load game that originally could only run off an Amiga hard drive. We'll download these from the link provided in the description. There are files zipped up ready for easy download. We're gonna copy the contents of the zip file to our Steam Deck over time. We'll do it via SSH and we'll put the files in the Emulation ROMs Amiga folder. Let's recap. We have put our BIOS, AKA Kickstart images in the right spot. We have two Amiga games copied over to the right spot. We should be good to go. Let's flip over to the deck now and see how well we've done. All right, we're now ready to fire up EmuDeck and see that sweet Amiga category show up. If you copy the games over right, Emulation Station should present the Amiga category and show two entries within, one for Psycho Squares and one for Zombie Apocalypse 2. We'll run the scraper feature within Emulation Station to give these entries a little pizzazz. Once completed, your two new Amiga games are ready to launch.
Well, look at that, developer unknown. Well, you know now the developer is me. Our next step is to launch either game and see how to enter the RetroArch settings menus. Because of all the settings you may emulate on your deck, Amiga is the one you're most likely to have to visit these settings to get games working correctly. As soon as you launch Psycho Squares, press L3 plus R3, that is clicking in on the analog sticks on the deck, you will be presented with a quick menu for RetroArch. If you look at the bottom left, you'll see the emulation core we're running is PUAE, which is just what we want. The menu item that will be our home away from home for a while is options. This is the nerve center of the Amiga configuration, and you can set these on a game by game basis. Inside of options, there are two areas of configuration we'll be mostly using. So let's briefly look at each one of these before we have to make changes to one to make Psycho Squares work. We'll start in system. This is where we tell the emulator what Amiga hardware we're going to be emulating. RetroArch has different configurations for floppy disks, hard drives, and CD images, which would be for Amiga CD32 games. As you can see, if you load up an ADF or floppy image, it defaults to Amiga 500, which is an OCS machine with one megabyte of total memory. This is a very good configuration for a huge portion of Amiga games that came on floppy disks, so we like that. It is using Kickstart 1.3 though, and that can cause some trouble later on. We'll get to that. For hard drive games like LHA WHD Load, it defaults to Amiga 1200, an AGA machine running a much newer Kickstart and oodles of memory. This is also a very good setting. We won't change any of these unless we need to though. Video is another uh, location you're going to want to be familiar with. PAL and NTSC can cause certain titles to be cut off or have large borders around them. That's a bit more of an advanced discussion, though. Let's go ahead and resume the emulation and see what happens when Psycho Squares continues to load. Oops, it died. And there's really nothing here to tell us why. <laughs> We're going to come back to that issue later. Let's get something up and running that does work out of the box. Zombie Apocalypse 2. Escape by holding down the menu button and tapping view and you'll return to Emudeck. Let's run Zombie Apocalypse now. Hey, this booted right up. This works perfectly. All right, let's go ahead and exit out now. Let's troubleshoot this Psycho Squares issue. When you see any sort of failed return code, this often means the command that was trying to be executed wasn't found. In this case, type is a command built into a higher version of Kickstart, and lower versions need the command included on the disk to work. I know, you never would have figured that out. I don't blame you. With that knowledge in mind though, let's up our version of Kickstart to version 2.04. Start the game, then get into the RetroArch menus. Go down to Options, then System. For Model, change it to A500 Plus version 2.04. Back out and hit Restart. When the game loads, you'll see some text typed to the screen. That is exactly where it was failing. As you can see, the game is now loading as it should. That's great, but we just changed the default behavior of the emulator to always run disk images under that new A500 Plus setting. We definitely don't want that. What we need to do is create a separate configuration just for this game, and that is actually pretty easy to do. Hop back into RetroArch and change our model back to automatic, back out and resume. By doing that, the default options have been changed back. We'll go back in again and go to Manage Core Options. Select Save Game Options. As you see, that creates an options file for that particular game. Now we back out, go to Systems, Model, and back to A500+. Restart the emulation.
we can confirm that the game does boot, but let's verify with the state of the art ADF that came with the pack that you downloaded. We'll start the demo and make sure that the model is still set for automatic. Perfect. Anytime you plan on making changes for a particular game, save a configuration file for it first and then make your changes. Easy enough. Let's move on to some advanced topics. Games with multiple disks. I see this a lot on Reddit. How do I change disks? How do I handle disk management inside of Amiga emulation? There are many Amiga games that come on multiple discs, but your goal should be avoiding these releases and trying to find LHA WHD load versions where the game discs are all combined into a single easy loading game file. But sometimes you don't have any choice and you'll need to be equipped with handling multiple discs with Amiga emulation. Since nothing with Amiga can be easy, we have three different scenarios we want to cover when it comes to handling disc changes. Playlist sets manual, playlist sets automatic, and finally a pure manual process of literally just shoving a different disk in. Let's start with a less elegant solution, fully manual disk swapping. And we're going to use this old game Barbarian 2 to illustrate this and some other advanced topics later. This is a two disk game I chose because it literally has the best disk change screen ever. You'll see what I mean in a minute. In this case, we'll just blast both disk one and disk two over to our Amiga folder, knowing that they will both appear on the list in emulation station, and we'll start the first disk manually. This isn't the way to do it, folks, but you could use this for quick game vetting before doing a more in-depth process of setting up playlist sets. Right, so we're now in our Amiga section, and there are the Barbarian disks. We'll fire up disk one the normal way. Many Amiga games have cracks or intro screens. Usually a left mouse click, and in our case, left trigger, will skip it. You may also see trainer options giving you an option for infinite lives, health, invincibility, or other cheats. It's solely up to you whether you choose to use those or not. The clicking you're hearing, by the way, is the authentic sound of the Amiga floppy disk drive clicking away as it reads the floppy disk. The head motor shifting between sectors and tracks, if you're an old Amiga head, this is almost soothing and hypnotic. If you're not, it's probably a little bit grating. Ah, we're here at the title screen now, great. A little more to go and we'll have our character select. More disc loading, snooze. Notice how the music is playing and stops on cue with the new screen? We'll talk about this more in a little bit. Welcome to the Dungeon of Drax. Choose your warrior. All right, let's pick the girl, right? Of course, we're going to pick the girl. And we'll wait for it to ask us to change discs. In 
insert disc two. <laughs> The best, right? We'll enter RetroArg menus now and go down to Disk Control, then choose Load New Disk. Using the File Selector, we'll choose the Disk 2 ADF file. Now we'll hit Enter on the keyboard or Return. If you don't have a keyboard attached, by the way, use the View button to bring up a virtual keyboard and hit the Enter button there. The game continues to load, and we're playing. This is a terrible game, honestly, so let's bail out of here. Let us set up a playlist now, or an M3U index file, so we no longer have to pollute our Amiga games list with two poorly named disk images. Essentially, an M3U is like the old MP3 playlist file. It is simply a text file with full paths and file names to the disks necessary for this game. On some systems, you can use relative paths, but here on deck, at least at the time of this video, you needed the full path to each disk on its own line. The M3U file will go in the Amiga folder, named cleanly for the scraper to pick up. The other two files we're going to dump into a folder called .amiga-hidden. The dot at the front designates this folder as hidden though we'll still see it for a while. And going forward, you'll put all your multi-part game disks in here, named appropriately with numbers or letters. We'll call ours B21 and B22. After all, who cares what they're named? And this is really easy. The full path to your emulation folder may look different than what we have here. We're assuming you're on the micro SD card, so the full path looks just like this. There, now we have our hidden Amiga folder with two disks in and a playlist file pointed to them. Sweet, let's see how we did. Restarting Emulation Station to pick up the files and we're back in the Amiga and there she is. But is she seaworthy? We run the game and wait for the disk change screen. I could put that disc change clip on an infinite loop. I love it so much. So this game requires the second disc to be inserted in place of the other one. A trip to the RetroArch settings and back to disc control. This time we'll hit the eject disc, then we'll change index of what disc is inserted. Currently, the first disc in the playlist is inserted. Let's change to the second disc in the playlist, disc two. Then we have to click insert disc. We should now be ready to hit enter. Amiga calls it return. As you can see, the disc swap was good and the game loaded. All right, this covers the manual process as well as the playlist manual swapping scenario. The automatic switching with playlists is a little like voodoo. I'm not 100% sure how it works, but it seems to work. Many Amiga games will happily use multiple disk drives if they are connected to your Amiga. This means you can take a two disk game, stick disk one into drive zero and disk two into drive one, and anytime the game needs the second disk, it just picks it up from the other drive. No disk swapping. 
For these types of games, you will not be required to perform the playlist swap. The emulator will simply access the other discs for you completely transparent, the way things ought to be. As you see in the video, if you have the two disc demo, nine fingers, and you did the manual method, at some point during the video playback, you're asked to insert disc two. It will sit there and wait. However, if you have a playlist and launch the demo with the M3U file, it will automatically mount both discs and use them without a prompt. Let's quickly put together a playlist and configure it just like we did with Barbarian 2. All right, we've moved the files over. Let's get back to the deck and see it work. Restarting Emu Deck and the Amiga category shows the Nine Fingers demo. Let's run it. Let's wait for her to wave her hands in the air, signifying when disc two would have been requested. Boom, the demo never even hiccuped. The discs containing the playlists were just used with no manual process whatsoever. If you can't find a working LHA WHD load version of a game or a demo, this is the best we can hope for. I would like to point out that if Barbarian had supported this though, we would have never gotten to see that very cool disc swap screen. How about some faster disc access, huh? If you want the true Amiga experience, you will be patient and just deal with the slow load times. After all, emulation is supposed to be accurate to the original machine, faults and all. Sometimes though, we just wanna plow through the loaders and get to the goods. Certainly Barbarian took its sweet time to load. Let's see if we can turbo speed the floppy drive a little bit. Little disclaimer here, changing the drive settings can prove disastrous. Games might not load, crash when they shouldn't, etc. Since the Amiga frequently used non-standard disk operating systems for speed and copy protection. In some cases, trying to speed it up won't work at all and it'll just be the same speed. But it is most definitely worth a try. Let's start Barbarian and break into the RetroArch settings. We are about to change settings, so immediately go up to options manage core options, and let's save a new configuration for it. Sweet, now we can play safely. Go down to media, floppy speed, and let's select turbo. Now you might be tempted to mess around with things like automatic load, fast forwarding, and these other things. These sorts of things can actually remove things from the overall experience. And I recommend you don't mess with those for now. All right, now that we're turboed up, let's see how long it takes to get to the first screen. Restart the game. Well, this is already faster. Clicks are faster, lots faster. This load took 35 seconds, while without turbo, the time to the title screen previously was a full minute, so we cut it down by half. I realize that uh, 35 seconds doesn't seem quick, but it's half the time. Now use this setting with care and turn it off if things seem funny with the game that you're trying to play. 
Hey, speaking of funny, why are the graphics so shrunk and tiny on the screen? Surely we can improve this. With all the variations of resolution, PAL versus NTSC, and even more Amiga shenanigans, there are some games and demos that will look like they are shrunk, while others seem to run exactly like you would expect them to, like state of the art here. In these cases, you can use some automatic screen zooming. Again, this can disturb the 100% accurate Amiga experience, but most people like to have this as an option. Back to Barbarian, let's break into the RetroArch menus, let's go to Options, Video, and Zoom Mode. Set this to Automatic. Now let's restart the game. Now we have faster load speeds and we should have better graphics. Well, it's already starting to look better. You'll notice when the title comes up, it's off-center during the animation, then sort of pops into place. This is a side effect, and you're gonna see this from time to time. Here we are on the character selection screen, and yes, it's zoomed to fit. Let's see if the game itself is. Even without turbo speed, we, the Amiga Loyal, spent a lot of our day loading. There we go, and the game looks good too. All right, sweet, so we now have Barbarian looking good, loading as fast as we can, and you know how to do it all. Well, it's been a long video and I thank you for sticking through it all. I hope this gives you a, a great handle on how to make your Amiga emulation dreams come true. And as always, please leave a comment, ask a question, like, subscribe, and if you want to know when more videos like this one drop, hit the little notification bell. I'm Shane R. Monroe, and as always, thanks so much for watching, and take care.